This is sportish. Do it better. This is sportish. This is Portish. This is Portish. This is the one year anniversary of Sportish. The show that no one asked for has been assaulting your ears and your eyes for 52 consecutive weeks. I'm Jeff Brault. He's Dr. Keith Struller, Director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Our producer is Mike Wallace. And Keith, what a long, strange trip it has been to our paper anniversary, but without any interruptions. 52 up, 52 down, sportish, coming at you for a whole year. This is an unstoppable force of nature. They said it couldn't be done, but we did it anyway. They said they didn't want it. We didn't listen. And now they're stuck with it. So I will tell you what, I feel so good on this paper anniversary. I will take plates. I'll take stationery. I will take a notebook, a notebook. What are those? The, the, the college rule notebooks. I'll take any of it. Send it to us. If you can find us, send it to us. This is a real accomplishment. I, I have there. Look, I think this is this is certainly true for you. You've probably had very few relationships that have crossed the one year mark of magnitude. It's not, it's not wrong. I mean, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I'll put it to you this way. In my life, I've had exactly as many relationships that have crossed the one year mark as I have had television shows. <laughs> So Sportish right now holds a very special place in your heart. <laughs> it is your, your sweet little something. And so, <laughs> so I hope all I hope, because God knows, I mean, we're not getting, we're not getting filthy rich off of this, you know, although we do just fine, but <laughs> the God, what do you think this memorabilia is free? <laughs> but I hope. I hope it brings as much joy into everyone, all of your lives as it does into ours. Cause a lot of people think we just do this for ourselves. Yep. The numbers tell a different story. It seems like there's plenty of you that enjoy it or at least stuck watching it in the same way that we're stuck doing it. But I do hope it brings as much joy. And I hope when we climb out of this deep pit of despair, that is the pandemic, which I think the light is, the light is, you know, is there. We just hope it's not a train. When, when we get out of there, we hope that you will still find time to hunker down on your couch at 3 p.m. on Thursdays to, to join us in this ritualistic. And I hope, I hope when you think back on the pandemic, on the worst year of your life, you think of this. You think of Sportish. Now, look. We are going to do a regular show. This is not a full retrospective of the last year that was Sportish. We do have a regular show to do. We're going to talk about the NCAA tournament that just wrapped up. We're going to talk about the big news, Major League Baseball moving the All-Star game because of political reasons. We're going to talk about what country became the first country to back out of the upcoming Japanese Olympics. A full Sportish show is coming your way. But before we get to that, look, dozens of people were touched by Sportish this year. And some of those people wanted to, to be here with us in this moment. Now, we don't have the technology for them, which is code for us, meaning we don't have the ego to give up the, the, the camera time um, to, to actually physically have them live on the show. So they, they be clear, in, like clarification. We actually don't have the technology. <laughs> I just someone that that handles we, we, we have a limited license, so. We don't actually have the technology. Yep. Continue. But, but a lot of people did hold their cell phone up to their face to commemorate the one-year anniversary of Sportish. And, uh, and, and we do want to, to uh, have, let those people share their thoughts with you about what this moment means to them. I think it's safe to say that I'm not overdressed for a podcast called Sportish. To be honest, I thought when you first told me it was called Soap Dish, which is just about right, given some of the things that come out of your guy's mouth. You should have your mouths washed out with soap. As for the dress code, come on, guys. I mean, I've seen better t-shirts at a flea market. Step it up a little bit. 
Maybe your time over the last year would have been better spent playing miniature golf. Think about that one. I've never watched Sportish. Frankly, I don't even know if it's real. All I know is that once a week, Keith goes down into the basement, and for the next hour, I hear nothing but eruptive laughter. I just assume it's a Zoom party. I don't know why he has to call it the show. Anyway, I don't mind, but I will say, hey, Keith, if this is real and you are watching, you may want to check out your laundry basket. I think Mia peed in it again. Keith, Jeff, congratulations is about the nicest thing I could possibly think of to say about making it to the one year anniversary of Sportish. A couple more weeks and it'll be almost a full year since a guest actually agreed to come on and talk to you guys. I'll never forget when you first asked me to do you the favor of producing this program, but what I have forgotten is why exactly I said yes. Happy one year anniversary, and please pod like it's the last. Hi Keith and his Sportish team. Just wanna wish you congratulations on making it a year. Didn't think you had it in you. Hopefully your sophomore year doesn't suck. For those who don't know me, I'm Keith's administrator. Uh, so I'm only doing this because he basically said that I had to, um, and nobody wants to hire a pregnant lady. So good luck next year. Wishing you the best. Take care. Hey guys, Jay Friedman, 2020 Sportish Guest of the Year here. Just calling in to say congratulations on your first year on the air. Um, as the primary provider of content for your program, I did want to say thank you to each of you individually. Jeff for inviting me on the show for a Christmas white elephant party and then refusing to part with the gift that I rightfully won. Keith for providing a backup gift of a comically oversized t-shirt which never actually got sent to me. And also to you, Mike Wallace, who I've never met, for cutting off Keith when he tried to uh, mention a guest spot that he did on my own podcast. The Pain Cave, which you can find on any of your usual podcast providers. Mike, thanks for cutting him off and telling him no free ads. So here's to a great year of inane conversation that really had nothing to do with sports. I look forward to more mindless babble from the two of you guys, and uh, maybe we'll get some sports information sometime in 2021. Cheers. You know, it's uh, it's times like that when you you kind of know who your friends are. You know, you know, you know who really cares about you. And I'll tell you what, we just saw we just saw five people that really the, the care. I mean, Jay Friedman, Jay Friedman, <laughs> Jay Friedman. I mean, what what does he owe us, right? I mean, Jay Friedman, Deborah from work, my wife, John Frankel, Mike Wall. I mean, this is you can't you can't. It, you know, we don't deserve it. Like, I mean, I, I understand that, you know, for us, for you and I, like what we've achieved in making it to this milestone, you know, I get why it's special for us. Sometimes though, when you're in it, right. When, <laughs> when you're putting in the blood, sweat and tears to, to make a show like sport, you're in the bubble when you're in the bubble, know, like when you're burning the midnight oil to, to put together the quality of program that we strive to put together each and every week for 52 consecutive weeks, you sometimes lose sight of, what it means to people and to get to hear to get to hear from from those folks that are that are close to us and, and to hear what they think about us i mean it's really touching um and and i mean at the risk of sounding you know egomaniacal or full of myself like i mean i agree with everything that they said i think they were spot on um and it's nice to know that what we do here um you know, that, 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 it, that it matters. Yeah, it matters. It matters to a lot of people. And I, you know, again, I think we do the show for you. We do the show for you and we enjoy yeah. doing it. I understand, but I, I Jeff, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for both of us. We live very rich, full lives. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean look, <laughs> we don't are... need, I, I don't, I hate to say it. We don't need sportish. We don't need sportish to feel whole and complete but what i what i've what i now know is they do they do and i mean look 
they say that your friends are the family that you choose. And I think, you know, if, if I've learned anything today, as we reflect on what we've been able to do over the last 52 weeks, it's that we've, we've created a family <laughs> and, and it's a family built on love and mutual respect. And, and, and I'm touched. I'm really touched today. And Keith, I can tell you're, you're holding back tears. I can tell that you are touched as well. I am touched. I am touched. I am touched. I've been touched by an angel today. It's hard. You get a little choked up, right? When you hear those things that people say about us, you get a little choked up. You know, they, I've always said, wouldn't it be great if you could be at your own funeral? And I feel like today we were. But I do think, look, as nice as that was and as heartwarming as it was, I feel like it's a little like I'm um, like senior day, right? In college athletics, you have this big emotional reflection, but we still got a game to play. And I think we owe it to the people to give them a, a, a solid episode of Sportish. Absolutely. Look, if you're going to give that much to us, the, the very least we owe you is one hell of a good show. And so sit yourself back out down on the couch, grab your bucket of, of, of fat and... <laughs> And strap it in because we're going to give you the ride of your life right now. Get ready for the best ever episode of Sportish. Take it away, Jeff. Let's start with the NCAA tournament, what some are calling the second most important thing on television this week. <laughs> I thought when you take the entire tournament as a whole, I thought the men's final, you know, didn't quite live up to, especially didn't live up to Gonzaga UCLA. You know, the, the, the Zags just couldn't solve uh, Baylor's ball pressure, their defense a little too much to handle, wasn't particularly competitive, wasn't particularly compelling. Uh, I think the women's final was exactly the opposite. Terrific, terrific game. Great showcase for the sport. I think when you take every game as a whole on both the men's and women's side of the ledger, one of the most entertaining tournaments I can remember. Absolutely. And at a time when I think a lot of people were questioning whether we should be holding these tournaments in the first place, you and I agreed it was the right thing to do. I, you know, and people that thought it wasn't the right thing to do will still hold that opinion, regardless of the perceived success of, of the event. Um, I think if you look at the two sides of the ledger, certainly on the women's side, there were obviously a lot of eyeballs on the women's tournament this year, probably more than, than previous. And that's for a lot of reasons. Some is the, the inherent growth of the game. Some is because, you know, we're all still experiencing COVID and are looking for these, these big moments. And some was the, you know, the, the exposed inequities at the beginning of the tournament. So in many ways they had, this was a moment where they had a, a real showcase opportunity. And I think they certainly lived up to it, particularly in the final four, which is, I mean, that's when, that's when you really earn, earn your dollars. And so um, I think there are a lot of people that at least right now are suggesting that they are converts to the women's game. And we'll see if that, you know, people like to say things now. This is a, an interesting moment in history. So we'll see if that actually, you know, if, that, if that's true. We have viewership numbers on the women's tournament and every round was up in a year yeah. in which almost every single sporting event yeah. saw either small or downright dramatic declines in viewership. Uh, each round of the women's tournament was up by between eight and 15%. Um, I think you illuminate a lot of reasons why, but do you think there's a reason why in a year where everything else declined, the women's basketball tournament rose? Look, uh, some of this you would assume is, is, is just kind of secular at some point, you know, the women's game is becoming more popular. So you would expect there to be uh, to be, you know, higher viewership, but it, it, it shouldn't be counter, you know, the trend. I think, look, I think, again, we're living in a, in, a, in a very interesting moment in American history when I think we are all very uh, publicly examining inequities. And I think certainly there are very few places where there are greater inequities. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into the discussion of why or fair or not fair, but there certainly are inequities in viewership in you know, in salaries and so forth between men's and women's athletics. And you had two very similar products, right? And one gets a lot of, of eyeballs historically and a lot of resource and, and one gets less so. So I think a lot of people looked inside themselves perhaps to say, you know what, I think I'm going to, I'm going to give this a shot. And so I think that drove some of that viewership. Um, and so, but again, we'll see if that's a sustain. I do think, I think you'll see sustained higher ratings over time. Now, whether, you know, just because you have 
one year does not a trend make inherently, right? And so I think you'll see those numbers continue, whether you see continued growth. I mean, that's really, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to happen over the course of the next couple of years that are going to change viewership patterns entirely that have nothing to do with women's or men's basketball. Right. So. I mean, and growth is a funny thing to begin with because, you know, it's really hard for something like the NFL to grow because it's already <laughs> so popular. I mean, look, we pick up 15 viewers in a week and all of a sudden we've quadrupled the amount of people that are enjoying Sportish. So, you know, it, it, it it's all measured on a scale. But I always I, I always like it when they're when when they're like, oh, there are only 700,000 viewers for that game. I'm like, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> now, I will say, you know, they say that all press is good press. Right. And I think the fact that the inequities generated so much coverage in places that would not have otherwise covered the fact that there was a women's basketball tournament going on. I think that is what spurred a lot of people to watch. A hundred percent. A hundred. I don't, I don't agree that all press is good press at this point, uh, but, but I do believe, (laughs) I do believe that that was, that, that did, that did draw a lot of attention, particularly on social. I think there was just, Mm -hmm. it, it drove a lot of attention. And so that was a, now if we're looking at the men's side, I think the story of the tournament is uh, Florida not fulfilling their destiny. Mm. And of course they came up against the juggernaut that is Oral Roberts. You know, we all knew that was going to be a tough out. <laughs> so I think yeah. we all realized we all, when we saw that room full of, 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 you know, scrappy kids without masks getting ready to cheer for their team. We knew, we knew that there was destiny, destiny <laughs> well, on I mean, the look. side of that team. So much of winning in March is being fearless. And the, 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 the folks that are part of the Will Roberts community showed that they aren't scared of anything. Uh, they, they aren't scared of airborne pathogens and they aren't scared of the Florida Gators. Uh, one yeah. of the Cinderella runs of the tournament, Oral Roberts. But I will say, look there, and the story, the story of this tournament, well, I, I suppose the story of the tournament was almost that Gonzaga, a mid-major program, and it still is a mid-major program. It's in a, I, I mean, you could, I mean, technically, yeah. I understand. But it's a mid-major school, I know you like a major conference. I don't know if I'd call it a mid-major program. I don't know that they have a budget that looks like, uh, that looks like. Uh, it doesn't look like basketball. Baylor's. It doesn't look yeah. like Baylor's, but it also Baylor, doesn't look you know like, it also, it also doesn't look like St. Mary's. So it's important <laughs> it to keep that It doesn't look like mind. Baylor's because Baylor's is limitless. Baylor's is like, the, is like a salad bar at Ruby Tuesdays. <laughs> it just doesn't stop. <laughs> You got that Dr. Pepper money. You know, Waco, Texas is where Dr. Pepper's from. Of course I know that from Texas. By the way, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people when, uh, when uh, Coach Drew at the end uh, mm-hmm. said, this is for Texas. A lot of people in Texas did not want to be included. <laughs> Those of us that grew up not Baylor fans. I'm, I grew up in Houston. The, the semifinal game really hurt me, that, that Cougar game. I, I knew it was coming. But I think, look, in looking at the men's tournament, I, it was also a very fun tournament. And I leave the, the final game aside. Mm-hmm. Baylor was just – there are very few teams that have rolled through a tournament the way that they did. They were never challenged throughout the tournament. And they caught Gonzaga after a really tough emotional game when Gonzaga just seemed to be off their game that night. So every, leave that aside. This was some really good basketball. There was some really good basketball. And that UCLA Gonzaga game, I think in retrospect, will still go down as one of the greatest college basketball games of all time. Yep. And, and that, and that final shot is, is memorable, uh, you know, for years and years to come. And I do think we should do this every time. I know you like to, we should really think about what kind of story Gonzaga basketball really is. This is a small school out in semi-rural Washington that has become a national power. I mean, it is. it blows your mind. It blows your mind. Yeah. They've been so good for so long that it does get lost that they play in the West Coast Conference, that they don't have football, that – they don't have, you know, the budgets of the schools that you expect to be there. And yet they have the ability to recruit players like Jalen Suggs. You know, they have the ability to keep a coach like Mark Few. Now, granted, they pay him a very good salary, a salary in line with what the head coaches at the Blue Blood Universities are well, making. But not, but, not, not fully, but, not fully in line, not fully in line. He'd get more if he went to Texas. He, he'd get more. Well, yes, he would. Uh, but and then he'd get he, fired, <laughs> but he, exactly. But he's built something that's sustainable and he's stuck around. And, and I really do think, you know, something that I believe is certainly true about sports at any level in any game is that winning is never an accident. 
and they've won an awful lot. And I think you have to look at what's been the constant and it's been, it's been Mark few. Like, I think he is just, he's, he's got the touch. So I read, I, I think I, I texted you this quote. I read a quote from uh, Rick Barnes, uh, mm-hmm. the current coach at, uh, at Tennessee, mm-hmm. formerly at Texas, went to Texas from Clemson. And apparently when he was at Clemson, this was in reference to the new coaching hire at the university of Texas uh, said, coaches are never, coaches are never, happy unless they're unhappy or something that effect right yep. Co- coach oh no it was, it was sorry coaches run from happiness that's what it was coaches run from happiness right and this was in reference to the new coach at university of texas who had mm-hmm. essentially a lifetime deal for almost the same salary. chris beard at, at at texas tech granted it's lubbock lubbock is the only the only town that looks at waco and is like you want some come you know like that <laughs> I mean, t- t- Lubbock is <laughs> Lubbock is a city that when you visit, they 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 introduce and they take pride in the fact they have no culture. Like they're like, look, we just want to let you know we're very proud. No art museums here. Like, <laughs> so Lubbock is Waco without the couple from the HGTV show. That's what you're telling me. They're one Absolutely. HGTV couple away from <laughs> from from being Waco. <laughs> so so Lubbock no picnic I understand like maybe that's it maybe you're like I'll take a job anywhere I'll just get me get me out of here but he had essentially a lifetime job at Texas Tech and he found a pathway to success really good program that they play there it you know they it's a the the alumni appreciate and he left for for the University of, of Texas and and they asked Rick Barnes who obviously was unfortunately you know was ushered out of, of Austin, even despite having a, a really good program and has proven this again by having a really good program at Tennessee. And everyone's like, why did Chris Beard leave that? And it's because he couldn't be happy. I mean, he had a perfect situation it, and it, it, you had to run. It was like, well, there's a, there's a burning house. I might as well go and run into it. All right. For all. And, and the question I was getting to the question, do you think Mark few is the only coach that has figured out how to be happy? I mean, in Tacoma, Washington, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, but I, I think at the end of the day, he, he's taken a look at his situation and, you know, realized that wherever he goes, he's got a, probably a better chance to win a national championship at Gonzaga than wherever he's going to go. Right. Because when you're coming out of the West coast conference with the resources that he's got, he's basically got a spot in the dance on lock and, once that happens, it's just a matter of putting the pieces together around it. Like, and you know, I, and he doesn't, I, I think he, he doesn't have to get beat up. The, he, he doesn't have to get beat up by Michigan and, and, and Ohio state and Iowa and whoever else you play in like a big 10 gauntlet the entire year. So by the time you get to the tournament, you're like, well, that was tough. So I, I so he, uh, it, I, I, I agree, but it, it's gotta be hard. It's gotta be hard. If you're a Mark few to, to, it's got to be hard to not look at a, at a North Carolina job or a Kentucky job and think about maybe I should try that. Well, I mean, I think at this point he's got to start wondering, like, will I, can I get over the hump and win it? Right. Because we learned when Butler made back to back national championships, we learned when VCU went to the final four, like at the end of the day, you have to finish the deal. Otherwise yeah. you just become a nice footnote and everyone's like, Oh yeah, that small school, they got close, but they didn't win. It went to who? Oh, the school with the third highest athletics budget in the world uh you know he's been to the final four now i believe twice he's been to the national championship game now once he hasn't closed the deal and i think that's gonna be what makes you think like maybe i do need the resources of a insert power five here um but but we'll see that's that's to be determined um while we're on the topic of um of insulting texas i was shocked to learn that <laughs> Baylor's win was only the second ever national championship for a yeah. school from the state of Texas in the sport of men's basketball. The other one was Texas Western, Glory Road. <laughs> now UTEP. Now UTEP. <laughs> you know, obviously, if things had turned out a little bit differently for the Cougars in the early 80s, we'd, we'd, we'd have a different story. I'm one of the only people that watches the Jim Valvano story and cries for an entirely different reason at the end <laughs> i'm like why did you leave him open hakeem you're a, why why did you leave like why didn't you stay by the hoop that was your man <laughs> why did you do that so uh yeah it is well you know of course i mean uh in texas you actually play basketball with footballs growing up <laughs> <You> know, <it's, laughs> 
<laughs> it's tough. I mean, let's be clear. It's really tough historically. Now, maybe, maybe this will change. It's really tough to convince the best athletes in your state to not play football. This is like, I mean, I understand Texas is an incredibly rich athletic, uh, you know, kind of landscape, but it's very hard because every coach is grabbing you from day one. And if you're a big kid, if you're a big boy, they're like, you're going to be playing foot. You're going to, you look like a tight end. You look like a wide receiver. You look like a quarterback. You tell me, you find me a point guard that wasn't first kind of given a football and be like, you look like a quarterback. So I just think, I mean, every, every, every four, every four has been recruited as a tight end, right? Every single one. And so I think it's really tough to get that. And then, you know, at some point you're now having to recruit out of state and historically it's been like, come play at the university of Texas where no one will know that we have a basketball team. (laughs) So that's why Baylor's quite a story. I mean, Baylor's good at everything. I mean, it's not a huge state university. So, it's uh, they have, it's know, a little have bit a like of- why we can't get our act together with a national men's soccer team, right? Because our best athletes have no interest in playing men's soccer. The U.S. men's national team is not going to the Olympics again. Now, the Olympics on the men's side is basically irrelevant because the European country, like, we don't want to care about this. So they just made it a, a, an under-23 tournament. But our under-23s can't beat Honduras. So I feel like that. That is an under, like, how are we? I mean, this is not an insult to Honduras. And not. I don't. I, we no, might it's be an insult to America. <laughs> no, I'm just going to, what I'm about to say. What <laughs> I'm, I'm asking for forgiveness for my future transgressions at this point. So this is not an insult to Honduras. I, I hope we're on there. I hope FDF Honduras is, you know, we know we're what's on their, in some foreign countries. What's their government like? Do they have free and open internet? <laughs> so that that's bordering on an insult. So you're walking. Uh, I'm <laughs> asking a question. I don't know. I don't know. They could be a flourishing democracy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just don't understand how we lose to Honduras in kind of any anything that involves that's a competition like i just feel like the resources are here i mean the resources are right here. by the way like that wasn't the most insulting thing we said about honduras <laughs> what <laughs> i don't know how we lose to them in anything that's a competition <laughs> no i said i was gonna say something insulting i got in front of it no offense but <laughs> I said no events. But who else did we lose to? We couldn't have only well, lost. Well, in the last World Cup qualifying, our our senior team lost to Trinidad and Tobago, which well, makes Honduras look like Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Not the German, the Germany of Central America. <laughs> Do they make Audis? <sighs> All right, I'm. Mean, you know, I've been All thinking right. about these electric cars lately. Why? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, have, I haven't been sleeping well recently, and these tournaments haven't helped because you're up late, True. you're out of your cycle. I mean, do they have to start a game, by the way, at 930? Is that completely necessary? I mean, I, have we reached that age where we complain about <laughs> game start time? Well, What's so- next? How are kids going to get into the sport? <laughs> They're going to watch it on YouTube the next day like they would have if it started at 7. <laughs> I don't care about the kids. I just don't like staying up that late. And then I'm eating late and then it's midnight and you eat, I, you have to eat all the way through the game and then you feel bad the next day. I you're, just, you're, nothing you're about it works. You're a little older than I am. I think there are two moments when a man crosses over from a, from a young man to an old man. One is when you complain about what time sporting events start. Yep. The other is when you tuck a t-shirt into your pants. Well, wow, that's... The- <laughs> I'm never, I'm never, but I'm never going there. I'm never going there. This is a weird question I'm going to ask. <laughs> oh boy. I, I mean, I used to travel a lot. I used, to, it's almost an inappropriate question, but, but it's a weird, <laughs> I used to travel a lot with, with sports teams, obviously in college. And uh-huh. there were some guys that always used to walk around in hotel rooms with their hands, like in their underpants, <laughs> just like in, like that was like a casual state of affairs. Is that weird? Is that That's weird? The, the question is, is that weird? It's weird to me. Okay. It's um, weird to me. Let's get, 
Let's get back. But I, but so, but I will never tuck the t-shirt in. You're kind of an old person. You're a, you're an old, younger person. I would say you mm. hold many older characteristics. Your watch fetish, the, the, the deal with like restaurants. Fetish. <laughs> so, but the, the, the electric, I've been seeing all this about electric cars. How is this conversion going to happen? Through electric cars? Yeah. I mean, I'm in, but I'm, but it's just, I feel like I, I don't know that we can answer it in the in the, the context of this well, program. I mean, I, I'll give you what I think is the short answer. I think the conversion to electric cars will happen when you don't have to physically charge the car. Like you don't actually plug in your car yeah. to a port. The battery technology will get to be so good that you can literally lift the battery out of your car. It'll be, you know, yay big. And you can carry it inside and put it on a charger. And then in the morning you can go in and put that battery back in the car. I think when that happens, because you think about parking and things like that and long yeah. range travel, like it's almost impossible to have an electric car and drive significant distances. Are there going to be arguments like there are with like cell phones and houses? Like who, who yeah. took the, who took the charger for the car battery? Yeah. Who took no, I, I think there probably will be, but it'll be like, think about how, you know, it just becomes second nature to you charge your them? phone. Are they going to sell them in the checkout line at TJ Maxx? Like <laughs> and I think probably, yes. I think there will be access to batteries and it'll sort of be like propane tanks where when one's empty, you can drop it off and replace it with another one. So, and then, you know, we'll all just share them. So when do I think it'll become ubiquitous? When you charge the battery and not the car. This is sportish. <laughs> by the way, TJ Maxx. What if, under what if, by the way, one of our 20 viewers is Elon Musk and he just heard that and went, I'm gonna just crack the code. I'm going to do that, it. Yeah. That old young man just cracked the code. <laughs> we can charge the battery inside. Why didn't we think of that? We were too busy trying to go to space. <laughs> Make the battery smaller. <laughs> These are like those little watch batteries. I'll take the, I'll take the X. And by the way, nothing harder to read in the world than the numbers on the yeah. back of a little, I mean, literally it's a joke. I mean, it's an absolute joke. You're like, I think it's, I think it's the X614. Oh. I'd like to add a third thing to my list of, you know, your old when, when you complain about how small some type is. That is the third thing behind complaining about how late a game starts and tucking a t-shirt in. When you go, why do they print this so small? You've crossed the Rubicon. But I mean, it's ridiculous. Those are silly. I don't know what the point is of that. I have good eyesight. You can't see that. You have to hold it. You're like, oh, if I just catch a reflection here, um, I, and it's always, you're always in like a CVS. I'm just going to catch a little light on this one. So, and you can't buy the wrong one. You buy the wrong one, you shove it in that battery, and you're like, oh. And why isn't there a universal watch battery? It's 2021, for God's sakes. Well, you know my thoughts on watch batteries. Oh, I know. No watch you need a battery. Let's talk don't send about a battery. The to, don't send a battery to do a waving arms job. <laughs> Let's talk about one of the bigger uh, sports stories of the past week. Major League Baseball, perhaps the most conservative of the big four sports leagues, moved their all-star game from Atlanta to Denver because of the new voting law that was passed in the state of Georgia. Uh, I am a little surprised, Keith, that Major League Baseball did this. I, I think the NBA would have done it. Um, I don't know if the NFL would have done it. I'm surprised that Major League Baseball did it. I think, again, we're, we're dealing with a moment in time, obviously, and I, I don't know that they would have done it last year, nor will they do it necessarily next year. And so I think... For whatever, you know, whatever the calculus was in the commissioner's office, there certainly was a recognition that this seemed to be a moment that would have could have haunted them if they didn't act. And I think I, I don't think this was certainly something they wanted to do, but I think this is when you look at what's the opportunity cost if we happen to if we happen to not make, I suppose, what they perceive to be the right decision. What's most like I think the one thing we said before when we start talking about the nexus of sports and, and politics, because it's rubbing up a lot right now, right, is what's happening right now is not particularly sustainable, right? It, it, we, we cannot live in a world where every year, like, we're moving our, like, you, 
you can only play your game in, in, in South Dakota, Louisiana, and Iowa. But we, I mean, this is not going to be sustainable over the long term. And so I am sure a lot of people in, the, in baseball are, are cringing, not because they agree or disagree, but because they understand the road that they're now going down. And that is, is in some ways, one of the more interesting stories. The other thing that I find interesting, and, and, and you know, look, all of us pretend to be experts on voting laws all of a sudden, like we pretended to be experts on, 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 uh, on infectious diseases last year. And I, so obviously I tried to make some sense of what the new laws are. I, I still couldn't give you full context. And I think I, look, I know what I've read and I know certainly what a lot of the commentators said about it. What's most interesting about this, and, and again, Nate Cohn and the New York Times did a, a really good job kind of breaking this down. In the end of the day, look, they shouldn't, I, I personally believe these are, it wasn't a good idea. It does have elements in it that will make things more difficult, but the net result is not likely to really change much of anything. And that's, I mean, really, so what's interesting is these laws where, and this is where I'll get to the, the, the payoff here, which is why this is such a slippery slope for baseball. These laws aren't really going to change the results of much elections, although there is one kind of kicker at the end where basically the state legislature has a lot more power. That's the actual dangerous part of any. Of it. It's not about restricting voting in it inherently, because that's probably not going to, it's not right, but it's not going to change the calculus of an election that much. These were laws that seemingly were made in response to a political reality, which is that some people think that the, the elections were fraudulent. So it's a law that's a political, it's, it's a political decision. And so in many ways, you have a sport now having to react to a politically influenced decision, which I think is, is, is going to be very challenging moving forward. Maybe it's a nuance, but where I disagree is I don't think it was a move made in reaction to a political decision. I think it was a move made in reaction to something politicians did in service of a lie. There that, was uh, no uh, it's semantics. I, I exactly they they because they because they they believe that that is so when they look at how they're boy this is not the show I thought we were gonna have. but when they look at <laughs> when they look at their pathway to maintaining power they believe they have to feed into this fantasy. Yes. Right. And so that's yes. a political decision. It's not because they think they're going to be able to keep X people from voting and Y people from voting. It's because they are they are egging up a base, right? They're they're jazzing up their base. Sure. By by so they felt that this was the law they needed to make. And so in many ways, now sports are now having to make decisions which are essentially politically driven decisions. It's a really bad place for us all to be in. It it is because and because if you think about it, sports moving you know, sports, major league baseball, moving the all-star game, like you mentioned, will not change the law that was passed in Georgia, but much is the way that the Georgia legislature enacted these laws in response to the fact that a certain block of voters believed that it needed to be enacted because of what they perceived as fraud, which right. didn't happen. Major league baseball needs to move the all-star game <laughs> in order to feed into the base of people that need to have pause in thinking, well, wait, if I support these policies, I may not be able to attend or have X or Y event in my state. And I completely agree with you. It's a wildly slippery slope. And I feel like it's an awfully disingenuous exercise because I think people's um, at, at, at least acceptance and at most celebration of politics and sport is entirely tied to whether you agree with the stand yeah, that's being taken. It's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent. Because it's because you know, and that is why it's such a you know. There are a lot of people who are like athletes should be able to speak their mind unless they're Kurt Schilling yeah. or unless they're Cle unless they're Cleveland not, Indians not relief pitchers. Ass. You know, <laughs> unless they're James Karen Chack from the Cleveland Indians who said, "I'm not going to get the vaccine." Like, believe me, they should be able to use their platform as well, long I'll as take it's that the vaccine, same platform. You send that, that down my way. Send it down my way. <laughs> so it does. I'll take create, all the extra vaccine. It does create a very unsustainable situation. And now here's a shocking statement. You talk about this not being the show you thought we were going to do. I want to make a really shocking statement. I think Mitch McConnell was kind of right when. What? When, when, when he came out and made that statement, like, well, he's not drinking. He's not drinking like, Coke anymore. They shipped all the Coke out of the office. They shipped all of it. 
And that's like, Coke. I, that's Coke Zero. That's the mango flavors. <laughs> that's the entire Sprite library. <laughs> but I mean, he, uh, what, what's, he, it, what's the orange soda in the in the Coke family? Is that a Fanta? I don't, I don't know which one it is. I think it's Fanta, but it could be Crush. Nobody knows. It could be Sunkiss. I don't think it's Sunkiss. I think Sunkiss is Pepsi. <laughs> Sunkiss is a Pepsi product. Um, but he made basically the statement that we're making. He's like, look, this is unsustainable. If every time there is a policy passed, if the 49% slash 51%, depending on which side you happen to be on, has some counter reaction to it, you can't maintain a society this way. No, you, you can't. That is absolutely correct. I mean, uh, we both agree this was a really poor uh, le- uh, legislative decision. It, it was unnecessary. It's not going to accomplish anything. It's going to it's going to gym up, gin up fervor on both sides. Yep. Um, and I'm going to tell you what, people are still going to get water in line. I, I, I guarantee you that. And so and, and, and even it, it, it was such it was such a show. I mean, this whole process has been such a show. And in many cases, what's happening now with baseball is a show as well. I, I don't look, it does seem as though the citizens, not that look, people like you're like, you're hurting Georgia. I'm telling you what, if I live in Atlanta, the last thing I, I is that traffic jam, like get it out. <laughs> one of the, one people of the are like, dumbest... New York are like we want it. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> one of the, one of the dumbest statistics was ever released is the Cobb County, who knows what board said that major league baseball taking the all-star game from Atlanta will cost them $100 million. They might, they literally like, might have just put out a statement. The game? Like, <laughs> they might have put out a statement that said that moving it will cost $70 quadrillion. Like that is how realistic it is to think that this the is- Major League Baseball All-Star Game is taking $100 million out well, of the, the city of Atlanta. We assume that we assume that, that every attendee is going to eat 100 hot dogs. Right. <laughs> and buy, buy 10 foam hands. And then, of course, have the Disney experience while they're there. So, no, it's, it makes it they, the, the woe is me moment. And by the way, it didn't cost them anything because it hasn't gone there yet. Yeah. <laughs> Can't lose what you never had. Um, okay. You know, we, we've talked about a couple of yeah. particularly consequential decisions, but now I think we have to talk about the most consequential decision that's coming up in American history. Okay. Who is going to be the next host of Jeopardy? Aaron Rodgers is currently going through his little audition right now. Aaron Rodgers, quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, same guy. Um, he is apparently a huge yeah. game show nerd. He won on Celebrity Jeopardy. He won on Hundred Thousand Dollar Pyramid. He won. He and he's he's in the he's he's in the uh, the uh, the upper echelon with Sinbad. He's up there. He won. He All won. Right. Um, Sinbad, of course, beat our good friend Jack Ford. Yes, correct. Who thanks? You know, I, I oh, understand why say- Jack. <laughs> wasn't able to be in that montage. We know he sent along his thoughts about the one year anniversary of Sportish privately. And we would like to acknowledge that we thank him for his kind Jack, words as well. To be fair, let me let's look. Jack actually won the real Jeopardy. This is the worst. The, the You want to talk about an Oral Roberts size update. He upset. He won actual Jeopardy yeah. as a law student or as a, 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 a and, and then lost celebrity Jeopardy to Sinbad. <laughs> that has never happened in the history of Jeopardy where someone has won actual Jeopardy and then lost to Sinbad and Celebrity Jeopardy. It's the first time it's ever happened. So Aaron Rodgers is not just guest hosting Jeopardy as a lark. He has made it known that he would like to be considered for the full-time wow. permanent role as Jeopardy host. And Keith, and he has gone so far as to say that he believes he could still be a starting quarterback in the NFL while being the full-time host of Jeopardy. This underscores two things. The first is that the host of Jeopardy might be the best job in the world because apparently you only work 42 days a year. Like to host Jeopardy, you only work 42 days a year. You go, you crank into that. I mean, I've been out in California. You go into that studio and you just, you crank them out. You just, you just roll it on out. And the other job, better job than Wheel of Fortune. Yes. The other, because it's intellectual. (laughs) The... The I love thing, Pat Sajak. Right. I love his snarky comments. I love here's, his snarky comments. Here's a question. If you're a starting quarterback in the NFL and you're the host of Jeopardy, yeah, which is your side hustle? That's true. This is... I mean, you are an NFL quarterback. You're starting on a good team. Yeah. I think, honestly, I'll tell you what. If you're the starting quarterback, Jeopardy is your side hustle. If you're a backup quarterback, 
then then the NFL is your side hustle. I think once you are a starting quarterback, that becomes your permanent. Now, if you're like a kicker or a punt, it's all. I, and to be fair, that may be a side hustle. Like that guy might be working another job anyway. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't know he was a doctor. <laughs> so now how much, how much money? Well, so he wants this now because this is like a, this is like, this is like his his shift is his retirement job. He, it's like he's calling games before he even retires. He's like Tony Romo for Jeopardy. Like this is a great. How much is how much? What kind of what kind of what kind of bank does a Jeopardy host make? Well, Alex was doing okay. <laughs> it's it's honestly probably more just as much, if not more, than a starting quarterback in the NFL. Is, is there anyone that you? would look up to more in the world than Aaron Roberts if he accomplishes this feat. Cause this is a course, little, a little on fact, or this is yeah, your dream job. This is your, so, this is, I no, asked you. No, it's not true. My dream job is mattress tester, but this one is on the list. Um, I asked you, I asked you a series of questions. Would you rather call this? Would you rather be play by play yeah. for that fantasy yeah. event? And I had to get all the way up to the Super Bowl for you to pick that over hosting a, a round of Jeopardy. I actually think I might still that that one's close because I think I might still t- well because it was one round it wasn't like the forever host the forever host of Jeopardy is way better than any job in sports because of the amount of fame and the fact that you're on network television for a half hour every single night. Um, that just it, says a it, lot about that says a lot about you. The fact that the highest the highest affirmation is that you get a half an hour of network television to yourself every night. That's it. You would murder a loved one to get a half hour of network television every night. <laughs> on, on like the CW. <laughs> so that's an interesting question. If Aaron Rodgers became the full-time host of Jeopardy, would he move into the Tom Brady slash Derek Jeter slash Justin Timberlake world where you're like, oh, that's a guy who's really got it all. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good third choice. JT lives, lives his best life for sure. Yeah. I think, you know what? I mean, I think, look, engaged to Hollywood actress Shailene Woodley now. I think it puts him in the conversation. I think it puts him in the conversation. That's a Hollywood family, too, between him and his brother. They're really doing well for themselves. That's true. His brother was on The Bachelor, though apparently they do not speak. Uh, that's which which kind of honestly sense. might even be another another check mark in his column. Keeps the circle small. It's hard to say no. Questions like this, Keith, are what we're going to have to answer in year two of Sportish. If you thought year one was good, just wait. <laughs> just wait. Podcast year version two. still available yeah. wherever they Always. are served. FTFnext.com and our YouTube page where you can catch up on old episodes as well. For Mike Wallace and Dr. Keith Strudler, who runs the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University, my name is Jeff Broad. Hey, thanks for a great year one. We'll see you next week in year two. Thanks for listening to Sportish. See you next time.